All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Allie Fulton Curran. I'm the public programs coordinator at ASI, and um, I want to welcome you all to our um, our first virtual U Mark Nod artist panel. Um, this is the Use Every Day section, um, and for anyone who um, has not joined. Um, or experienced a Yule Mark Nod before. Um, Yule Mark Nod is our annual Christmas market. It is our biggest event of the year. Um, and we were challenged to do it a little bit differently this year. So this is one of our components. Um, uh, one of the most special and important things about Yule Mark Nod is, is meeting the artists in person. And um, in order to do that, and have everyone do it safely, um, we created these artist panels. So um, this is our this is our first one and I hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott. Scott is our host for this session. Um, Scott is a great uh, a great friend of handcraft in general. He um, has spearheaded programs from the North House Folk School up in Grand Marais. Uh, he was the director of exhibitions and programming here at ASI and most recently comes from the American Craft Council. So welcome Scott and thanks to everyone for being here. Thank you Allie and thank you to the American Swedish Institute for having me. Um, wow this is wild. It's really great that you've been able to pivot like this and pull together what a great community here of um, maybe perhaps we're like the Brady Bunch of makers, right? Like we could just see each other up and down. Um, I'm really excited about spending the next 30 to 40 minutes with everybody and um, hearing your stories. At least this section of uh, artists and participants in the Yule Mark Nod. It seems like you had a super great lineup this year. And I know, I think there are numbers of sessions scheduled throughout the day today. So I'm hoping for everybody that's able to join us on this morning's call that you could stick around for the day and hop on to another Zoom line and, um, and hear these great stories from some amazing people doing really wonderful things. Um, Ali, I'm really excited to um, um, have this type of conversation about you know, using and making things in our everyday lives. That's very, very um, a part of why um, I've committed almost, almost 20 years now to promoting and advancing craft. It's always wonderful to wake up every morning um, and think about, well, Golly, what, oh, oh my gosh, right? As I, and I'm gonna hold up my, my, my egg pan here. I brought my egg pan this morning that I, I did clean up, I promise. Um, but you know, this maker here, these two makers, Corey and Vu um, from um, North Carolina, they do this incredible uh, metal work, right? And this is a pan that I, I wake up to every morning and sometimes I'll finish the day with a little saute in here as well. Um, and, and I remember my relationship with them and visiting their studio and seeing the hard work that they're doing to build an economy around um, making in their, in their own place. Um, so, you know, I just think that's really powerful moment for us all to reflect on is what is it in our everyday lives that is important to us and how do, and how can we bring more handmade materials into that? Um, one of the small reflections here that I want everybody to think about is um, there's a great book um, uh, called Fewer Better Things that was published, I think two years ago now by an incredible writer, Glenn Addison. And I'm just gonna quote this and I'll set this conversation up with, um, he says that a well-made object is informed by thousands of years of accumulated experiment and know-how. Whenever we make or use an everyday tangible thing, or when we contemplate one seriously, we commune with this pool of human understanding, right? So every object he says represents a potential social connection. And by understanding the tangible things in our lives, we better understand our fellow humans. And I just, again, I'm super grateful for ASI to be able to pull together this incredible slate of makers who are creating things for our everyday lives. So with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and we'll get this conversation started. We're gonna move very quickly um, over the next 30 minutes. Um, we have seven makers, I believe, that are gonna tell and share their story with us. So um, as you're going, just a reminder, there are three dots on your screen. If you click onto those, you could use the chat room and enter a question there. I know your mics are, um, I'm silenced right now. I'll read that as we're talking here and I'll try to fold those into the conversation. If you have a question for a particular artist, feel free to add it there. You can also find um, links to their shop sites and um, their Instagram handles. So if you want to continue the conversation or see exactly what it is they're selling, which please support these artists right now, you could go ahead and find it there. But let's get started. Sue, oh my gosh, it's so good to see you online. Um, Sue Flanders from Kilns of Flanders. Um, Sue, really quick before you get going and showing us the work um, from your studio, can you tell us about one object that you think is really important that you use every single day that's handmade? 
I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'll let you start. Oh, that's off. okay. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Scott. Sue Flanders. Um, yeah, I would say I, a mug. It's very personal. You hold it in your hand. You bring it up to your lips. You usually wrap your other hand around it. You know, to me, that's a real personal item I use every day. So, Thank you. Yeah. So I think I'll get started by showing you guys a tour of my studio. So I'm going to pick up my camera phone here and flip um, so you can see everything. It's kind of like Santa's workshop right now. It's pretty busy in the studio. So what you're seeing here first is my um, table where I do a lot of my work, kind of research and development. In the back of the studio here is my um, potter's wheel that I work at and then a wear rack that's on wheels that I can um, wheel in and out to the kiln room. And so it's kind of nice to have that convenience. And I also wanted to show you what I'm working on. Every year I make a new ornament. Those of you that have visited my booth in the past um, usually know that I <laughs> kind of known for my ornaments. So this year the ornament was a goat and the goat came from an idea. I really wanted to do a Yule box for years, but I couldn't quite define straw in clay very well. So I uh, kind of got into watching goats on the roof. If you're familiar with Al Johnson's um, Swedish restaurant in Sister Bay, Wisconsin. <laughs> he is very famous for having goats eating grass on the roof. And so I thought, well, that'd be cool. Let's do goats. So I got myself a goat cookie cutter and you cut out basically a goat. For the goat, I actually do um, three layers. I do two goat bodies. And then I actually take the goat from the cookie cutter and I take his head off because I want him to be three-dimensional, not two-dimensional. And then I, um, cut out his belly just to make him a little lighter so he doesn't hang on the tree too much. And that little piece becomes useful later. Then as I'm building the goat, I'll take the two parts of the head, sandwich them together. I actually make a goat sandwich with an extra layer in the body just to define his legs a little bit better. So you can see there's some separation there. Um, so that's kind of the next step. That little part that was the belly, roll those into a ball that becomes the goat's nose. So let me swing this around here. So then we have these parts. I kind of finished where I joined all the seams, um, finish that off so it's look a little smoother. I'll attach his head and then I'll put little eyes on him. So little, little ball eyes have kind of dried out because he's been sitting here for a while. Then after he's all done, we'll put him together, do his finishing. So you put his face, um, poke him a little bit, give him some eyes, ears, nostrils, a smile, um, give his beard a little fuzziness. And I put a little wire in the back. It's a um, nickel chromium wire that can actually withstand the temperature of the kiln um, for him to hang from, which is nice. In the old days, I used to drill a hole um, through the entire animal. It didn't work well. Then when he's done, he comes out, I, or I paint him before I fire him, give him a little color on his antlers or his horns and his hooves. So that's kind of the goat series. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, I'm just going to swing around real quick so I'm not making dizzy, but I've taken a lot of classes from ASI in their folk school, and I really think it's important to do continuous learning as an artist. And so one thing I did was I took a birch bark class from Beth, and everybody who's ASI fans knows Beth. Um, and so I started to make birch bark containers with basket handles woven with birch. So I actually got a permit from the DNR this summer, harvested some birch, and started making these handles. So I was pretty excited about that. That was kind of a fun thing. And I'll just kind of scan the shelf here. And I'm going to go down. I also took a class from Piper Fleck Blomquist, who teaches um, Swedish painting. And I got inspired by her Kerbet's flowers, which are these really wild flowers you can kind of see on the moose antlers. And normally in the Swedish paintings, the Kerbet's flower is planted in a pot. When I took her class, I said, I really don't think a pot is my thing. I said, I kind of like animals. So I said, let me try something different. She's like, whatever you want, Sue, go ahead and do it. So that's kind of what I did. I made this flowery antler on canvas in her class. I was like so rudimentary. Everybody else in the class was like professional painters. And there I was just kind of plopping, you know, paint on the canvas. But I think in the long run, I've worked on it a little bit more since then. It's worked out pretty well. So I'm going to flip back and put you guys back on my little stand over here. So that's basically what I had to share. Um, Anybody questions? Did you see any come up in the chat or are we out of time, Scott? I don't know. You know, you're, that was amazing. Really, no, okay. that, I, I'm getting some great comments here. It's wonderful to see how you're using different mixed materials, right? And continuing to learn, Sue, like, oh my gosh, I love that. It's about so important. Work. Yeah, really important. Wow, to learn from others too and spend time. So thank you. Um, boy, good question. And I'll come back to that too. One, one of them out there, is it really difficult to get one of those permits to harvest birch bark? And, and how was that experience for you? Um, I worked with our local DNR office, with the forestry office. They were very good. 
Super. And again, I think ASI has a whole list of, of handmade workshops that you could sign up for. And Beth is incredible. Um, wonderful person to learn from. So thank you so much, Sue. Love seeing that. Now I know how to make a goat sandwich. Thank you. All right. There you go. <laughs> Let's transition here. Thank you, Sue. Um, and again, follow Sue's site if you want to see her work. Um, that's for sale. She's got great shots up on her Shopify site or her shop site that you could uh, pick up from. But Sandra, oh my gosh, we're going to go all the way over to Otter Tail, Minnesota. You're way up, you're way up there. Tell us a little bit about what's going on up there and, and the camera and mic is yours. We do have you on, on mute right now, Sandra. I'm going to try to figure out how to take you off mute. I'm sorry. There we go. Okay, there. How's that? Perfect. Now you're la That's lovely. Thank you. Okay, yeah. It's beautiful up here this week. I love Otter Tail. You know, my family, my mother's family is from here. My mother is Finnish. She's from uh, Northern Finland. And this is a really strong Finnish community. So I grew up here as a kid. We built a home here. I built a studio here uh, just a couple years ago. And it's just, it's beautiful. Uh, it's uh, a great place to work and make, make wear. I, you know, I was uh, earlier in our conversation, I was saying I really get inspired by the environment up here. Um, you know, the ice, I'm, I'm a water person. I think if I came back in a second life, I'd come back as a fish probably. But I love the lakes and the water. And as, uh, uh, as the seasons change and the water changes, the clay deposits, I haven't found, I have some on the lake, but ones that only make glaze, I haven't found, haven't created a clay body out of it yet. But um, it's just a wonderful place to be in Otter Tail even though it's a small community, 330 people. And I think I'm related to about 40% of them. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, Sandra. Small towns are amazing spaces to work with. I know that we have some folks I, from Gallery 201 as well with us. Um, Sandra, can you tell us a little bit about your setup too? Like you, you were showing us and, and um, the strong, kilns. Uh, yeah, Say, I'm sorry, say that again. Can you tell us a, a little bit? That's okay. We have a little delay here, and that's that's perfect. Um, do you can you tell us a little bit about the two kilns and um, styles of firing that you work with, and then the different effects that you get on some of your work, or maybe even show us some of the the cups and bowls there? Sure. Yeah, I fire with I fire to a high temperature, uh, cone ten. Uh, so 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit, and I fire in a gas soda kiln. That is what you see behind me, the large door that's open right there. That's the interior of the kiln. I can fit a couple hundred pots in there. And then I also fire in an electric kiln, cone 10. Um, both are wonderful processes. I use the same clay, same glaze with very different results. So here's a good example. I like to have been inspired by birchware. I haven't gone and harvested it, but <laughs> I, I'm surrounded by birch in my uh, neighborhood. So this clay and this clay, these are the same, same clay, same glaze, uh, fired in the soda kiln. That beautiful orange flash is a result of the soda ash interacting with the silica in the clay. And this is exactly the same, but fired in an electric kiln. So it doesn't quite have, so it's more, I call this my river birch series. And this the is gold my and amber. Right, white birch series. Yeah. Really, you know, the cool thing, one of the cool things about clay that has always been important to my touch is the malleability of the material. Pushing and scraping and denting the surface to make these eyes or branch areas that might come out from the uh, from the birch tree is just I never get tired of it. It is really a wonderful exploration of the material to express you know actual tactile objects. It's really exciting. So that that I mean and what a stark difference between but how exciting and I love both of them. Both are really valid ways to fire. You know, some people 
don't always agree with that, but I, I think it is. The rest of the work that you see here are mostly, these are from my soda kiln, same clay body, but you have a little more interaction, interface between the atmosphere in the kiln and the uh, clay and the glaze. I'm a big fan of pattern, you know. I grew up surrounded by Mary Mako. My mother has Mary Mako everywhere. And uh, so I, I realized that some of that patterning kind of spills back to that childhood experience. That's terrific. Yeah. Well, thank you so yeah. much, Sandra. That's super lovely. Again, I could see us, uh, I could see a class here, ASI. I don't know, take all the artists you have and let's go out into the woods for a week together, create and make and be inspired by nature around us. I love what you're doing with those that bird series. That's pretty incredible, Sandra. Stay tuned to that. Super great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. Great explanations. You get Thank some you. love from the audience out there. Yay. <laughs> um, let's see. Yay. Let's, <laughs> let's move on. Um, just to keep uh, keep with our time here. Um, oh my gosh, I am so excited to have Marion in the room. Um, super indebted to uh, Marion and her just super lovely textile work. Um, a few years ago, I don't know, I'll put this in the chat room too. It's a link to the holiday room we did way back in 2014. We reached out to um, Blue Dot and uh, Forge Modern Workshop. And I think it was um, um, a couple other people, designers, and they picked up on your work and put the table runners and set one of the Minnesota Maker Holiday Rooms, which set us off in all new directions um, for decorating and lighting up the Turnbot Mansion during this holiday season. So it's super wonderful to come back and have you in on this conversation, uh, Marianne. So thank you. If you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about um, your work and show us some examples, I'd love that. Hi, Scott. Thank you. Um, well, I had, uh, uh, previous to this career, I had a, a career as a commercial interior designer. And I had, uh, uh, I studied design and I studied color theory and all of that came into weaving. Now, I, 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 you had uh, asked me before what inspired me to, to start weaving and Basically, I went from being an interior designer to being a mom um, and I needed a creative outlet. So I explored different avenues, different medium. And I, uh, a good friend of mine suggested that I take a weaving class with her. And so that's what I did. And it just resonated with me. So I decided that I would continue taking classes and uh, gosh, a couple of years later, <laughs> I decided to uh, uh, maybe stop taking classes and start practicing weaving all the things that I had learned. And uh, this also gave me the opportunity to explore linen, um, which is what I weave. Um, and when I started weaving linen, uh, it was a real turning point for me. Um, I found that it, it just spoke to me, spoke to my soul. And so I started exploring and designing textiles on the computer. And as my weaving skills grew, so did my looms. <laughs> so now I have a, a huge space filled with looms. Um, so it, currently my my main loom is an AVL industrial Dobby loom. Um, it's con computer controlled and it's uh, powered by a large air compressor. And the air assist lifts the harnesses, it throws the shuttle and it beats the beater. But I still have a lot of work to do while that's going on. I, I stand by the loom. It's not that I don't weave anything because I'm very involved in the whole process. Um, now, as far as, as uh, the textiles design goes, um, my Scandinavian heritage influences my approach to designing. I enjoy that less is more um, approach to design. So it's clean and simple, straightforward, but also with a little bit of flourish. Um, 
if you look at the Scandinavian culture, this aesthetic seems to run through everything that they do. A, a very simple, even primitive bowl may have whimsical embellishments or, or the trim around a door may have intricate carving. Um, simple tools may be rose mauled with vivid colors. So um, the, their design though, uh, the Scandinavian aesthetic is, tends to be strong and bold, um, but it's also entirely practical and functional. So um, this also is what defines my weaving. Mm -hmm. um, I really appreciate that, Marion. You've hit on like three, three factors, right? That you see consistently that makers have to, con to contend with, right? Like materials, um, uh, the tools that we work with, um, and the design in the end. And I think that you're constantly juggling these variables to come out with some, some pretty incredible work, um, whether you're in the forest or you're visiting a collection at a museum. And that's one thing I really miss and really treasured about my time at ASI is, is looking at the valuable vernacular collection, the, the Rosemald work, the, the bowls, the, the, and you look and you see these, you know, rural farmers and, and makers of all sorts using utility objects in their everyday lives in profound ways. And there's a sense of beauty, right? That under, under um, uh, um, it's, it's not very loud, right? But it's there and you know when it's right. there. And your work is just absolutely reflecting a lot of those variables. So thank you so much for joining us. And thanks, I, I, your site is gorgeous. Um, I think the French love the Scandinavian design. I love you have a French photographer picking up on it. It's great just to visit even, um, but I got to get one of those table runners for sure for the holiday season. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> that was great. Um, if you do again have questions, um, please do. Um, yes, like you're getting some, some, some kudos out there in the chat room about introducing other fiber artists to linen, which is really important. So thank you. Um, thank you. Please add those and we'll kind of come back to those if we can, or at least we'll feed your questions um, to the artists after our talk here in our time. So keeping in time, we're doing really good right now. We're gonna go ahead and um, bring in um, Becky. We have Becky, oh my gosh, Becky and, from fiber and, um, uh, fi fiber and felt, which is really exciting. Um, one of the things, Becky, I remember encountering these at my very first, well, I think the Yule Mark Nod, you were there for the first time and um, looking at the um, no-kill faux sh sheepskins, the no-kill faux sheepskins. I'm like, what is this? This is absolutely amazing. You know, these were made popular by the character in um, um, Game of Thrones. I feel like he was walking around with these big sheepskins. And, um, but I, I want to hear more about um, your process for making those, or maybe you could show those off for us a little bit. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm Becky Utech, and I'm in Ogilvy, Minnesota, about an um, hour and a half north of the Twin Cities. And I got sheep like 19 years ago just because I wanted sheep. Not because I want to do fiber, but it really changed my life um, getting into the wool and fiber arts. Uh, previous to that, I was a painter and I, I did Ukrainian eggs as well. But so I got the sheep and um, I didn't, uh, let's see, I started, I learned to spin and process the wool, but it was like 2006 that I, be, I discovered felt making. And felt making is like really, um, well, just, it's just so versatile and so immediate. But I think it was around two, I made my first felted fleece in 2011. So um, nine years, almost nine years ago. Well, nine and a half years ago, almost 10 years ago. And I've been teaching this process since 2014. And I've taught like hundreds of people how to make these things. But um, yeah, so I take the sheep are sheared in the spring and you just take that fleece off the shearing floor, you, you uh, skirt a little bit away, but um, mostly what I, when I make my felt pelts, okay, so they're called felt, I call them felt pelts, but they can be vegetarian sheepskins, humane sheepskins, um, but the fact is there is no skin on them. It's all just felted, and depending on the, depending on the type of wool that you're using, it could be a nice dense rug that when you get out of bed in the morning, like I do, I step on a nice Cheviot rug. Um, or if you're chilly on your couch, and it's a very silky one, more like this one, Gret Gretel's is a little more silky. Um, 
then in, if you're chilly in the winter, you could just cover up with it as a lap blanket and it just warms you so quick. So uh, the way that I make these is just with the, the um, you know, the shorn fleece raw. And um, then, well, this is some uh, comb top. So I have some, the dirty fibers, the dirtier fleeces that aren't good enough for a felt pelt. I send, you know, I wash them and I send them off to be processed into comb top and roving. And anyway, um, so with my felt pelts, I just lay the roving over the, the cut ends. And then it takes uh, some hot water and some Dawn dishwashing liquid. Are you following me? <laughs> Got me? Okay. Um, anyway, then we rub and roll. And um, so this is like the inside of my studio because my, the felt pelts need to be done outdoors. They're very dirty. The sheep, you know, the, the wool is the sheep's house. So um, hot, hot water and soap and it looks uh, very muddy. But anyway, uh, you rub and roll and you uh, rinse and uh, it comes out like this. It's just kind of magical. You know. I love it. You have many fans out there that have um, taken workshops with you and, and are commenting on how incredible of a mentor you are and taking the time to do that. Kelly, I'm just seeing you online here. Is that one that you have around your neck right now? Yeah, you got a model out there online here. This is what's fun about Zoom is we could turn our cameras on sometimes and show off. So it's great to see the work in context. <laughs> um, just, you know, keeping in time yeah, with everybody. If you can, you know, you could follow along um, and see Becky's work um, on her site um, that's put up in the chat room too. Becky, did you have anything else you wanted to share with us before we jump ship here? Um, well, I was able to take a class a couple years ago at the Vesterheim for Schinfeld, Norwegian Schinfeld using the, and uh, so anyway, I'm making these cute little uh, Schinfeld um, prompties too. Oh. <laughs> Those are <Yeah>. terrific, <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you again, Becky. This is terrific. And you could see those Tumpties and um, many of the other products um, that Becky's making and has on her shop site um, if you follow the link there. So thank you so much. Wish yeah. we could be in person wrapping ourselves up with that, but um, we'll do, we'll, we'll have to make do for now. Um, well, this is terrific. Let's bring Kim and Donna in um, from um, Gallery 201, way out there in Dallas, Wisconsin. Um, Let's see if we could do that. Kim, yes, there we are. This yeah, is great. Hi, Good morning. Thank you Hello. for joining us. I was commenting earlier, I love your color palette this morning. Um, and I'm really excited to hear about, you know, these connections you've made between um, even Scandinavian design, but also inspired by Japanese um, pottery, right? Like where you started and how these different traditions have informed your work today. So maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about your background to ceramics and um, and what continues to inspire you. And, and I think we might have time for a little demo. Well, I don't know if I'll be able to do a demo today, but I can give you a little brief history of that one. Um, I, uh, I've been in clay for quite a while and I was really lucky to be able to do a, a trip over to Japan when I was in my 20s. And I think that really helped me uh, to uh, shape the styles of work that I've done. Um, I don't know if you can tell in some, some of the forms that I do that are, are a uh, sort of a Japanese style, but um, yeah, it's been a long journey. I have, uh, I, I just checked uh, some of the numbers and I've been making pots for almost 40 years. And uh, when you have that kind of a hobby, you live in non-traditional places. And uh, I've always had sort of a storefront living, studio space, uh, loft space or something like that. And I was really lucky when I found this building in a rural area, it uh, allows me to live here and have a studio and also fortunate enough to have a gallery space, which up until this last year, I've really enjoyed you know, uh, having uh, the visitors come in that are uh, sort of tourists that seem to be going by. Uh, Donna's been really great at sort of fixing up the facade of the building and turning it into, you know, a real welcoming space. I wish you could see more of it right now, but it's, it's probably half studio space. The back is 
all of our working tools. We have probably four kilns here. I have two wheels. Um, I like to use um, a ver variety of different clays. Um, we, we focus on a, a collaboration that is a combination of both of our work and I make, I'm, I'm the maker and she's the decorator. And I think it really works out really well. Um, the style of work is called Sgraffito. And in that we're using sort of a white, sort of uh, porcelain stoneware type of clay. And we use uh, slips under glazes that I paint over the entire pot. Like I'm gonna, put Don on, on in a minute and she can talk about her work a little bit. But this complete jar was coated with this brown color. And then she has carved away the complete organic patterns on this. It has a little acorn top. And um, I'm just gonna let her speak a little bit about that and then we can probably chime in back and forth. Wanna give her a little time. But thank you Thanks, very much Kim. for coming. Hi everybody, um, I'm Donna and uh, Kim is the one that taught me how to do this technique. It's called scrapito and scrapito means to scratch. So when I work on a piece like this and he's already got it carved or colored with the brown slip, I carve away with really fine little tools to reveal the design that I first pencil in. Uh, I do happen to love uh, small animals and folk art. And so most of the time the work that I do with Kim kind of has a folk arty feel to the pieces. Uh, I also love winter, so we do have snowflake things and reindeer and things like that on our pots. And it's just something that transfers over to other things that I do as well. Like uh, I'm learning how to do printmaking. And so I print make, I block print on table runners. I do little doggy bandanas. I also have bandanas for adults. And then I also learned how to do botanical printing, which involves the process of foraging for plants either in the forest or my own gardens. And I print those with leaves. And then I take my block prints and I print on top of that. And I get a very unique piece of wearable art that we I wear myself often. And they just make really nice gifts for people. And I'll hand this back over to Kim now. Um, I also love to do collaborations with people. Um, a lot of times someone will come in and they'll say, we need this or that. And that's always fun. It's a challenge. Uh, some people might look at it negatively, but I always like to uh, take the time to really try to understand what they might want. And I really enjoy, enjoy doing that. I have a press that I use that is um, uh, for making tiles. We've done fireplace surrounds, custom work for people. Over yes. the years, it's really been fun to see some of these projects, uh, you know, and that show up in all these people's homes. And if you have any questions, I'll take them from there. I appreciate that so much, you two. Thank you. I really wish we could come up and see Gallery 201. Um, up in Dallas, Wisconsin. And when all this breaks, I'd, I'd recommend everybody make a run up there. It seems like a beautiful site. Also wish you could be with us and we could pick up the pottery and, and, and see those indentations because that form is absolutely incredible. Um, your, your work, I know a lot of the work on your, your textiles, they're reminding me a lot of um, an exhibition we did at the American Swedish Institute with a paper cut artist from Norway, um, Karin Bitvaila. And it's just looking at, again, those old patterns and, and, and making those new again. And, and bringing those out in different ways and, and finding simple opportunities to bring craft into our everyday lives, including bandanas for dogs. Super brilliant. Take a look at Kim and um, Donna's <laughs> website if you get a chance. They they're, just have some wonderful work up there. But speaking thank of, you, Scott. thank you, thank you. Well, speaking thank of you wonderful, much. amazing um, websites, I wanna go ahead and, and bring Katie into the conversation from West Ash Designs. Um, Katie, hello, good morning, good morning. <laughs> Um, wow. One of the things I think I just am so appreciative of is the way you shoot your work and present your work. If anybody's out there and is able to jump online, um, boy, with plants, with little everyday <laughs> objects, right? It's not just that material that you're doing, but you're putting it in context. And I really appreciate that. So um, yeah, thank you. Good morning, Katie. How are you? 
Good. Well, yeah. Thanks so much. That's so nice. Um, well, this is, yeah, welcome to my space. Um, so I'm a weaver and I, I come to you from my uh, four season porch in Minneapolis. I'm really lucky to have a space, um, moved my family out, moved my stuff in. Um, and you can kind of see it's really sunny, which is great, but sometimes it's hard to see on video or photo. Um, my loom right here, I have something I'm working on and then all my fiber and stuff is in the back. And then I also have stuff all over the house, like in the basement, I have my sewing machine and basically a lot of my products, some are sitting next to me, but um, they kind of get stored usually in the basement. Um, and I'm currently working on, uh, I'm trying to move you and see if you can, I gotta unplug here. Let's see. Um, Something I really enjoyed doing is working with, I don't know, can you guys see <laughs> um, With rope. So I'm currently working on a throw blanket. Um, I kind of have a sample here. Um, and you can tell my loom is little. It's like a little baby loom compared to uh, like Marion's industrial loom, of course. And so this uh, throw blanket will actually be three pieces pieced together. Um, and I did a kind of a sample prototype one. So it'll be, I don't know if you guys can see, um, with the texture of the rope and things like that. So it's just kind of a fun play on um, trying to use different materials that maybe aren't often recognized in certain textiles and things like that. I've really been enjoying using cotton and, um, and linen and things like that. So yeah, I don't know. Well, thank you so much, Katie. I love the light right now. This feels so much uh, Minneapolis. I know for of us, for those of us who are chiming in from here, it's a gorgeous day, and um, I love that you're using the, the four the four season or three season four yeah. season porch now, right? Making yeah. do, but I mean, you know, I, I love your comments on uh, on making and craft, especially in this um, day and age right now. It hasn't been an easy year, right? I think yeah. that there's that to to acknowledge right now. Um, I'm seeing some great stories of success pop up. Um, and I think this is a year that makers have stood up in ways that we haven't seen yet. Everything from mask making and the call yeah. um, across the country to do that work. Can you just share any examples of how you've used craft to, to help uh, contribute to make 2020 a little lighter and brighter for everybody? Um, yeah, I think a few of the things. Um, so I'm pretty active on Instagram and just really trying to use my space there to share resources or organizations, um, things like that, uplift other brands or makers or what have you through sharing there. Um, and also just trying to raise, you know, provide for other organizations. So raise money for other organizations in the past. I've um, sold some old supplies and tools and donated all the profits of that to a local um, arts organization. And then did the same a few months ago and hopefully we'll continue this in 2021 a bit, but auctioning off items. So um, I auctioned off a scarf and was able to raise a couple hundred dollars for an organization that way as well. Just again, trying to use my platform. Um, incredibly privileged and lucky to have this space and um, craft is sometimes a large barrier. <laughs> Uh, financially. So trying to kind of eliminate those for other people. Thank you so much, Katie. That's terrific work. Again, wow. Round of applause for everybody here. Um, this has been great. We are getting to the end of our series. Um, really appreciate everybody hanging in there. We've got one more session here, which I'm really excited for. I know we've gone over a little bit in time, um, but uh, we are going to jump ship and go to another, yet another, right? South Minneapolis makerspace. I can't believe it. It looks like you might be in the studio, like a celery room in Italy right now, um, Bliss, but we'll take it. You know, we'll take it. Um, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Thank you so much. Welcome to my studio. I'm actually just eight blocks north of the Swedish Institute um, and my studio. So uh, when you support me, it's very local. <laughs> very local. <laughs> Um, I'm going to give you a little tour and show you um, uh, some of what I do. Um, so this is uh, beeswax. Um, when you buy candles from me, they're actually, it's Minnesota wax. So this is not wax from California. It's not beeswax from China. This is like from the neighborhood, um, from my bees and from other local beekeepers. Um, this is my um, kind of candle making area. This is my vat of hot wax. It kind of keeps everything to temperature. It turns off and on and keeps everything at the appropriate temperature for dipping. I love making hand dipped candles, which actually is highly unusual. A lot of people don't even make hand dipped candles anymore because it's so much work. Uh, but you know, I string the wick around this um, contraption here um, so I can make five 
uh, pairs of hand dipped candles at a time. So I just slide it down into the vat of wax and out, and it coats. You can see the wax is coating the straw. Wow. And the cool thing about that is I can make different size candles. I make smaller ones. These work great for uh, birthday candles, also for those little Christmas things that spin around and um, Hanukkah, menorah. Um, I can also, you know, make a regular um, size candle taper, regular size here, and different lengths too. I can I can make shorter ones and longer ones. So it's pretty cool to be able to make custom sized candles. Um, but uh, this is my drying rack where they dry. Um, this is different wick sizes for um, beeswax. Um, I use different size wicks for every candle, so I have all these different wick. A square braid, which is particular to beeswax, a square braided wick. Um, over here is the area where I make products. I make a whole bunch of different things, everything from uh, beeswax food wraps to lotion to lip balm, um, all of that, like different products I cook on these burners and I um, bottle and package things that have lots of different. Um, I like to use blue glass bottles when I can, which is fun. Um, this is, um, I'll show you a little bit of my honey here. I have this beautiful honey frame. This is literally honey from my bees. I can actually scoop it out and eat. I'm going to eat it for you right here. <laughs> uh, but um, this is capped honey here. So when I harvest the honey, I take a knife and shave off the cappings. And that becomes the wax that I make candles and things with. Um, I spin out the wax and put it in this bucket with a gate. And then I'm able to pour from the gate right into bottles. So that's kind of how it all happens. Very, very um, just natural, easy process. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, I'm going to, uh, I have, I make a lot of, like I mentioned uh, lip balms, like I make all these different essential oil combinations and make nine different lip balm flavors. <laughs> it's a little obsessive. Uh, my favorite being orange and clove. Uh, lavender peppermint is also really good. I do a fun little um, gift box called the Bliss Box. Um, it comes with like a beeswax candle, um, body butter, healing salve, which I make um, calendula infused oil and yarrow infused oil, which is very healing for the skin. And I make a little salve with it that you can use on wounds and sunburns and pretty much everything, rash, any of that kind of stuff is very healing. And then that my two favorite lip balms that I mentioned come in here as well, the orange and clove and the lavender and peppermint. Um, so that's, that's, what's that? that is super unbelievable. I can't believe you're pulling all of this off in this great space, just eight blocks from ASI. I mean, even some of those bees, right, that ASI has on their rooftops. I know they have the green rooftop there. Uh, might, yeah. might, might might be visiting you, right? <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah. And my bees might be visiting their bees, your bees as well. I don't, um, I'm just going to here to the other side of the studio. Mm -hmm. um, so I do my own labeling. Um, I have my printer, I print off my own labels, I hand cut them <laughs> and uh, uh, put them on my products. Here's a little collage of, I, you can also follow me on Instagram as well, Homesteading Bliss on Instagram. I'm, I'm always posting different fun photo photos, kind of documenting my journey since um, 2014 of beekeeping, six years of beekeeping, different things to highlight me. <laughs> me at the state fair um, for a while I was doing, uh, teaching in a farm school, teaching uh, boys at Hope Farm School in Wisconsin, beekeeping. Um, here's me in a bee suit. <laughs> uh, just some fun photos. Um, so yeah, um, if you have any questions for me too, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you so much, Bliss. You're getting lots of love out there. I know um, um, people are just amazed. Um, where do you sell your products other than on your site right now? Um, well, that's hard. I was doing uh, some gift shops. I, I do sell at Like You. Um, they have two locations. They're a great shop. Um, I sell for um, Highway North, which is in, it's not Stillwater, it's uh, Marine on St. Croix, which is a little town by Stillwater. Um, those are kind of my two main stores right now. I used to sell at Silverwood Nature Center, but they've kind of shut down their gift shop. So a lot of my sales actually are coming through my website right now, which is homesteadingbliss.com. Um, and I also um, sell locally here. I have a sign in my front yard that says honey for sale. <laughs> oh, I love that. I'm actually sold out of honey for 2020, um, but I will have um, more honey um, check back in July of 2021. And I'll have all that wonderful uh, Minneapolis basswood uh, linden flower honey that I tend to get from my bees. 
amazing, even so thoughtful, like the depth of understanding the products, right? Linden honey. I mean, for anybody who doesn't know, right, these trees are in our neighborhoods are bearing incredible um, opportunities for makers to to tap into and you're doing it in such wonderful ways. I really appreciate that list. This is really thoughtful work. Um, this is the type of work that I'd welcome everybody to think about as we're enjoying this, you know, end of year um, season of the light um, um, holiday, right? And if you're able to support any of these artists, um, including a visit to pick up your, your candles you'd like to light at night, um, you can visit um, Bliss's front yard um, or connect with her on her site. So appreciate that so much. Um, yes. And again, appreciate Free everybody. Shipping on my website and also option for pickup. So yeah. Cool. Super. Super. Well, thank you so much, Bliss. Thank you to everybody out there, um, all of these incredible seven makers. This has been great. Um, we will rebroadcast this uh, conversation so you can share with other friends or revisit it if you had specific questions or heard something um, from, the, about, from the artists you'd like to, to revisit. Um, I know SAI is planning to post that, I think, next week. So you and Mark Nod, the shop is continuing to be open. Um, for those of you out there who end up purchasing something online today, I believe they have a pickup, a free pickup um, at the American Swedish Institute that's scheduled for next week, I believe it is. Um, I'll let Ali and Aaron uh, close out the conversation and let people know about that. But I wanna thank everybody again for joining us. Great to have this, again, Brady Bunch of Makers virtual meetup. We're doing what we can do. Um, and, um, and everybody's support for handmade objects in our everyday lives. So thank you again for coming and, 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 and um, be well, you guys, be safe. Yeah, thank you again um, to everyone for, um, on behalf of ASI for joining us today. Um, again, yeah, the uh, select vendors are offering free pickup at ASI, which that pickup is next weekend, the 12th and 13th. Um, you can find which vendors are offering that at our website, and you can shop all of the vendors um, at our, I put it in the chat, but it's um, asimn.org slash virtual Yule, Yule Mark Nod. So um, I hope you all enjoyed this, and thank you so much for joining us.